Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Jess Spiro, Head of Content here at Simple. And on behalf of our whole team, thank you so much for joining us today. For those who don't know, Simple is an independent knowledge, data, and access provider to the next generation of family offices. And today, we'll be discussing branding for family offices. As the next generation begins to take over, the idea of creating a brand has shifted more into focus than ever. Does a family office need a brand? What goes into crafting one? And how should family offices approach this? There are varying schools of thought surrounding this topic from all sides of the industry, and we are very excited to be facilitating this conversation. Leading our discussion on behalf of Simple is Kyle McDonald. Kyle is a venture builder at BCG, where after eight years of working in family offices, he designs, builds, and scales new businesses focused on delivering impact for his clients. Joining Kyle today is our panel made up of experts in the family office and branding space, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dennis Schaffernick. Dennis is the founder of OMAC Group, a family office focused on exploring the relationship between artistry and investment, and he's also the co-founder of Concentric, an activist venture fund with a focus on partnering with early stage software businesses augmenting real economy sectors. Nicholas Pardon. Nicholas is the founder of Pardon, a modern family office and venture studio working at the intersection of art and entrepreneurship. Pardon unites with next-gen wealth creators to champion culture-shaping initiatives and fund impact-driven ideas. And lastly, we have Patrick Hanlon. Patrick is the CEO, founder, and author of Primal Branding Co., a global strategic brand and innovation practice where he partners with billion-dollar brands and entrepreneurial founder CEOs to build responsible brand communities. His work spans brands like Google, American Express, Levi's, VW, Shopify, Time Warner, and even Simple, to name a few. Gentlemen, Thank you all for joining us today. We are thrilled to have you share your knowledge and insight into the matter of family office brands. Before I hand over to Kyle, I'd like to remind everyone watching to send in any questions throughout the discussion. We'll keep an eye on the comments section and make sure everything is answered. That's all from me. Over to you, Kyle. Thanks, Jess, and thank you to the rest of the Simple team. Uh, really looking forward to the conversation today with this fantastic panel that we have. Um, obviously, a really interesting time as well to be talking a little bit about treading those fine lines between sort of privacy and legacy, all sorts of juicy topics that we'll be getting in today. Um, obviously, let me just give you an outline for the session. So really, the focus for today's session, for those of you just tuning in, uh, is this idea of the importance of brand building for family offices. We're going to be taking you through, you know, who our panelists are, what it is they're working on, uh, and then begin to unpack a little bit more about the topic. So we'll be looking at things like why family offices might need to begin to consider branding, uh, what the typical sort of considerations are, uh, uh, sort of circling back to this idea of privacy and legacy, uh, when they begin thinking about, you know, engaging uh, within the sort of brand building process, what is a foundational brand? Um, and how do you go about sort of building a dynamic one? Um, and then finally looking to the future. So how do we think that ultimately branding could potentially change the game for family offices? So perhaps I'll, we'll kick off with a bit of a round robin. Um, I would sort of start with, let's start with Nicholas. I'd love to know a little bit more about you, uh, what it is that you're working on, uh, and which organization you are from. Over to you, Nick. Hello, Kyle. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Nicholas Pardone. I'm coming to you live from Newport Beach, California. Um, I am the founder of Pardone and the principal. Um, we call ourselves a modern family office. And, you know, as um, Jess said, we unite with um, culture shapers and invest in, in venture and also have an internal venture model inside the family office. Um, I'm also the CEO of a digital publishing group in the U.S. called Optimism. Um, a lot of what has led us to success in that organization has been brand, has been identity, um, values-based work. Um, and through my entrepreneurial journey, um, I've had the good fortune of working with many artists, designers, creatives. Um, 
a mul- you know, many of those have now, you know, several of those have found their way into the family office system. And we've kind of continued to use um, much of what we've, you know, used as um, tools to build our ventures now have put that inside of the family office structure to both create um, the identity of Pardon, um, using a lot of those artist and design skills. Um, and so, yeah, so that's the, the perspective I'm bringing here is um, one of entrepreneurship, one of um, venture building, and also, you know, one of now, you know, embarking since 2021 on the, you know, the creation of my own family office and, you know, using those tools and um, skills and rituals to, to build our, um, you know, legacy brand. Fantastic. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to getting your perspective throughout this. Um, perhaps we pass over to you, Patrick, would be great to hear a little bit about, um, you know, your background, uh, sure. the types of organizations uh, you work with, uh, and their relationship to family offices, and ultimately, yeah, what is your sort of role and re- relevance for today's conversation? Yeah, so um, we look at brands as belief systems, and once you create a belief system that attracts others who share your beliefs, which very ar- organically brings together those people who... Um, believe in the same things you do. And it's the the root code for building authentic brands, as someone told me. And so we've worked with a lot of uh, larger corporations, uh, Google, Microsoft, PepsiCo, Levi's, and so forth. But we've also worked with the Gates Foundation in uh, their school uh, venture. Back in the beginning, we were on Oprah and some other things. I uh, worked with Time Warner on STEM. They were the first people to win Obama uh, at the end of his uh, term, uh, started talking about the need to introduce science, technology, engineering, and math into our schools. Uh, they had a red line, red phone <laughs> to a Time Warner who, is, uh, who kind of had all the facts and so forth. Uh, straight to the White House. And we also helped uh, the United Nations uh, come up with the uh, argument uh, for changing from global warming to climate change. And so we've uh, worked in a lot of, um, you know, profit and nonprofit things uh, over time. And what we found is that they all work under the same principle. Uh, A lot of celebrities also use Primal as uh, as I think Francois has uh, pointed out in his articles in Forbes and elsewhere. So that's where we are. And right now we think, I mean, this session is really critical, I think, because regardless of who is is in office uh, in the coming months, uh, no matter what country you're in, I guess, uh, it's really the private sector, not the government, that needs to take up a leadership role in uh, driving home solutions because by aligning our stakeholders across corporations, nonprofits, philanthropy, citizens, uh, we have the innovation, the expertise, and the resources to help solve some of, um, I'm just going to say our regions <laughs> rather than our countries, but our greatest challenges because the sustainable development goals, which we've also helped out with, um, are not necessarily working. Everyone has a white paper, but no one really is taking, moving those white papers into activations. And that's where we're failing. And that's where um, everyone here on this call can help. Fantastic. So I guess it's going to be really interesting uh, to get your perspectives as well on the impact that communicating sort of brand and legacy can have. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting. Yeah, and yeah. Also, I believe you have a book. Is that correct? Got a great book. I do. I do have a book <laughs> called okay. Primal Brand called Primal Branding. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, over to you, Dennis. We'd love to know a little bit more about your background, uh, which organization you're from, um, and your sort of role and relevance in today's conversation. So, thank you, Kyle. Um, I wear two hats. Uh, by day, I'm an activist venture investor. Uh, I'm a founder of a venture fund called Concentric. We're based uh, in London, where I'm where I'm sitting and Copenhagen, um, and have the privilege of sharing an office with, uh, with our hosts, um, Simple here. Uh, we invest in early stage companies across European uh, tech ecosystem that are solving non-trivial problems in very complex sectors. Um, so alluding to Patrick's comment around for private sector, building solutions for complex societal issues, uh, we, we focus on doing that in sort of the real world sectors. Uh, that have been going for, for the last 10 years. And uh, and by night, I'm a, you know I run a family office called Erma Group. It's a, it's a single family. Um, we deploy capital across some more traditional asset classes, 
uh, but uh, but the brand of of Airmark is really geared towards um, promoting activist partnerships with the creative sectors, um, where we build benches uh, with artists, support them philanthropically, and um, and uh, sort of develop their their, their businesses uh, alongside uh, alongside us. Fantastic. So I guess a lot of the time, also putting brands to work uh, with those ventures you build. Um, I might sort of hold the microphone or continue to hold the microphone with you, Dennis, just to unpack a little bit about this. You know, if we traditionally think of family offices, um, there's obviously, uh, you know, a lot of value in discretion and, and privacy. Um, perhaps you could sort of tell us why you think that, you know, this might be changing. So why do we think family offices are beginning to become a little bit more public facing? It's, it's a, I guess there's no simple answer around that. Um, uh, our journey wasn't sort of overnight uh, in a sense that we, we didn't we haven't decided okay we need to have a brand and we're going to build it over the next week or two with, with the contractor it's a uh, it's, it's kind of a long long process uh, of thinking you know what is it that we stand for what is it that we want to communicate uh, externally um, and is it going to be helpful actually to uh, i guess to, to 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 our counterparts to our partners that we are uh, aiming to attract and work with so um why maybe going back to your question why uh, is um, public facing brands or public facing communication family office become is becoming more important i think, I think there's there's a natural sort of um, uh, trend of um, public facing brands being individuals you know you look at social media um, and and you're kind of now expected to have a brand aren't you uh, if, if you're meeting somebody they'll they'll google you they'll look at linkedin and and, and you know what you say there shapes already people's perception of, of who you are professionally or socially um i think family offices are um they serve a number of purposes right so i'm, I'm sort of very gen generalizing and of course there's different levels of complexity as well you know there are, there are big institutional family offices that look and feel more like you know institutional investors uh, and there are more entrepreneurial families like like, like what I, I what i what i do that you know we don't we don't obviously need to to go uh, to go to that level of complexity but, but i think both need an element of um you know branding or projecting what is it they, that they do externally um whether it be for uh, attracting you know uh, investment opportunities if that's what you do uh, or building new businesses and uh, telling you know a positive story to your constituents um uh, or even personally for privately for the family members if it's a very large family with you know dozens of uh, multi-generational members then it could also be relevant to project you know some values across to that uh, that population as well interesting so i guess sort of over to you nicholas around this concept of values i, I mean if, if we look at sort of public facing in many ways your family office uh, has taken it to the next level you know it, it very much sort of reflects you and how have you sort of gone about beginning to think about how the values that represent you kind of get codified into your family office. Yes, I think the the goal too is to try to have the brand transcend me. I think that's really what we're trying to do is create, you know, there was an inspiration of using, you know, my own story and my own work alongside the team to build something, but ultimately the the purpose of our brand was to allow other people to you know, our team primarily um, to step into the identity. And I think, um, you know, we, in, in some ways it's, um, you know, it, it also, we use my surname obviously, which has, you know, etymology and to give completely. So it worked perfectly for the work that we were doing um, in a more virtuous circle of creation and then giving. Um, so the, the name was kind of very present and we chose to, you know, use that, but, Ultimately, for us, like the the values, um, you know, came out of a process of building the brand. I mean, we began with, you know, a very visual story um, that was, you know, very much inspired by time and legacy um, and luxury. We looked at a lot of the, you know, um, well-known watchmakers and people who, you know, really built a lot of heritage into what they were doing. We then studied the voice, like how does, you know, does part of want to speak to people? How do we want to connect with others? And then from there, you know, in that discovery process, the, the values emerged almost like uh, it became more clear through the process. Um, we're very visual forward. We're very like aesthetically drawn to things that are, you know, 
have depth, but are also, you know, very beautiful in that form. Um, and yeah, and I think it, it is a process. So, you know, you begin in one place and then you go on this ultimately like branding or identity journey. Um, and through the visual, I mean, language arrives and then, you know, these values start to appear and then you also, you know, then have a more comprehensive um, brand. And then it, it really does, as you know, I think as Patrick even said, it's these belief systems, which I definitely see. Um, and it does kind of attract the right people. Um, and this, I think, is very important for me because, you know, this is a very sensitive kind of organization, um, you know, very small team, very big, impactful work that we want to do together. And um, the values really keep us connected, um, aligned, and also allows us to, um, you know, maintain a sense of freedom, um, independence in our own individuality in the organization, but also keeps us very closely connected um, around our beliefs. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, a journey of very visual exploration for us, voice and language that emerges, and then these values start to um, appear as like the highlighted words um, in, in our own story. Fantastic. I think there's something, yeah, really obviously beautiful in that discovery process as you begin to kind of unpack um, and, and figure out how those values begin to kind of transcend you. I guess, Patrick, it would be great maybe to pick your brain a little bit. Um, around what role you think a brand could or should play uh, in how family offices begin to kind of um, explore their values um, and ultimately, you know, think about bringing that to life. Sure. I think the first thing that we need to point out is that there are two shapes for a brand. Uh, one is external, which is, you know, in the consumer world, that's the stuff that we see on television and here and radio and all that kind of thing radio <laughs> sorry um the uh coming back uh, magazines, to magazines and back. so forth and so the um and and youtube and instagram blah blah and so anyway it's the externally facing brand or seeing the shelf right and so the it's that's the external facing brand the website and the logo and usually um people think that they when they've done their logo and done the website that's the branding and it's all over they're done uh that's hardly the case, but the, um, uh, and the other is, uh, most relevantly for this group, I think is the internal brand. And those are the people that you want to have working with you. And it's the values that you share that, um, that attract others. And this really boils down when you're trying to get, bring in people and what are the, um, values that you hold? How do you act? Um, how do you shape those things and what do you all believe in? And so when people are opting between, you know, your foundation and another foundation and trying to figure out where they want to take their family <laughs> themselves and their family invest their, uh, their life work, uh, that's what it gets down to. Also, I want to point out that the, um, is how do we shape that internal brand and, uh, just two quick quick metrics to lay on top of, I think, what Dennis was talking about. Um, when people look at you and your brand, uh, they are looking, it takes five, you have to be in five different places in the United States anyway, for uh, people to really know that you exist, for them to even say, yeah, I think I've heard of them. So you need to be in five different places. So that could be the website, but what, when, but it's also LinkedIn probably one of the first places we go, right? Uh, it might be Facebook, it might be Instagram, YouTube, whatever, pick five, right? So that's the beginning. And and whereas uh, organizations like these used to be in more or less invisible, right? You had to know about them um, beforehand, I guess, whatever. Um, you, these days, at least in the U.S., you need to be in five different places. It varies from country to country. I, I would imagine that Europe would be about the same. Uh, and it also takes 100 hours to make a friend, according to some sociologists, right? So when you combine the five different places times 100 hours to make a friend, uh, those are at least two guiding metrics that we use to help shape media, our strategies, um, how we face, put our, Put our face against the public out there to the public the other thing that is important i think especially for this group is we need and working with uh banks and other financial organizations we need 
proof that we're uh, that demonstrates how our actions and activations out in the real world are um, taking place. We need things to point to, like uh, Carnegie uh, put uh, libraries in every small town in the United States. Perfect proof that he was out there in terms of philanthropy. Um, Hershey, I think, uh, helped orphans. Uh, Henry Ford uh, went, went to the $5 day, increased the uh, wages uh, you know, across the board. And so it, within the Ford company anyway. <laughs> and today we have the Ford Foundation, right? And Great. so anyway, what, uh, I, these are some of the I things that we use. Sorry, I was going to say, I think this idea of sort of, you know, actually the place making and the sort of legacy making kind of uh, leads us quite nicely into the next section, which is this idea around, you know, how do we begin to think about balancing privacy and legacy? Um, you know, increasingly uh, for a lot of family offices, um, you know, that this, this the careful dance sort of needs to happen around a public facing um, version of your family office. Um, and then ultimately also ensuring that there is a side of yourself and your family uh, that you're able to keep, um, you know, private. Perhaps Dennis, you know, as someone who's who's gone through this dance um, twice, you know, through Concentric and obviously your family office as well, it'd be great to kind of get your point of view a little bit on how you manage that, that sort of dance. Yeah, so the dance of privacy versus kind of having a public public facing um... A profile is a tricky one uh, for for a lot of for most family offices. I would say. Um, in fact, uh, I had I had some comments even even yesterday uh, prior to this webinar. People were sort of expecting a discussion and asking, "Well, isn't is, isn't that sort of uh, in conflict with the family office ethos? You know, having a brand and, and having a public persona." But um, I, I guess some family offices will be important to stay private just because of the individuals behind it. They, you know, they, they want to stay private. They, they, they value security, um, and, and I and I totally respect that. And particularly, particularly if they're more passive family offices, those that are like case capital. Um, and um, I, I'm I'm talking not probably uh, maybe unfortunately not in our league yet. And, uh, and and I'm very entrepreneurial. I love doing sort of building new things. And I don't think that's going to ever stop, uh, whether it be through Concentric or through Airmark. Uh, and so, when you when you're in that uh, business or in that sort of activity, you have to have a public profile. So, um, you know, it's really down to you how you shape it, isn't it? So, you, you know, you, you can give as much uh, away as you as you like uh, or as little. Um, so, so I, I don't think there is a particular conflict as long as you're active. You you have to you know be known for something. Um, and once you face that dilemma or once you face that question that you need to answer, it sort of naturally leads you down to the road of essentially building a brand or thinking about how would you communicate it, which is kind of the beginning of defining your brand journey. Yeah. Um, and I guess, Nicholas, if we think a little bit more about your experience, um, again, it you know, the, the public side of it, what were some of the, the risks that you took into consideration and ultimately why did your uh, did you opt to sort of um, yeah? What were the benefits beyond the risks that you explored? You know, I'm not sure we took that into consideration too highly. I mean, very similar to Dennis, I'm also an active entrepreneur, and I'm in the pursuit of of building and creating wealth, not just preserving or protecting existing um, wealth. So I think, but what I what I, when I was thinking about this topic or thinking about this question, I mean, one of the, that's something that I think is important that if privacy, security, um, exclusivity, these kind of words are very important to the family, then I think those should be brought forward at the brand creation time. And I think then it gives that opportunity to have the brand be in control of the narrative. Um, because I think wealth owners um, at, at any level are, it's important to have some construct of, of what the, what we're doing, what our story is, what um, impact we're trying to create in the world. Um, you know, if, if you look at the typical, you know, makeup that uh, of what a family office system might look like, especially here in the U.S., there is a foundational element to it. There is a, a giving part and, an, and a creation of wealth or, you know, and so I think, you know, maybe 
the brand story is through the foundation lens. Maybe the 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 brand story happens through more of the impact than the you know more investment capital arm. But we, because of our pursuit in very active entrepreneurial work and collaborating with other founders and even other family offices to do this work, um, we knew we had to be you know you know a bit more public and a bit more um, out there. But at the same time, I think there's still a reserve vibe to our brand you know we're not even how we use the system where we allow the logo to be where we you know where we would put the brand and and how it you know and and almost all the rules that you can't do with the brand or what make it very exclusive or private and so i think that to me while privacy is not necessarily a value for us um i think it's very present in maybe the identity as well, or it's, it's quiet tone. And so I think that's where it's like, sometimes it might be if privacy and those val those are very important to your family, this is where brand can help in ensuring that privacy is maintained and that, you know, we're public with what we want to be public with. And I think we're just growing in greater scrutiny around, you know, wealth holders to say something. Um, you know, I, even personally, I've met really incredible humans who are doing great things in the world. And then when I go and try to find anything about those great stories, there's nothing there. And, you know, they're referencing this foundation and that. And I'm like Googling it and I'm finding nothing about it. And I think that is not great for our communities. That's not great for, um, you know, their ability to, again, like attract talent or you know, and so I think, yeah, privacy is something to be upheld, I think, for us all. Privacy, security, safety um, is critical. But at the same time, you know, being out there and controlling how people perceive us um, and how our teams get to embody some form of identity is just incredibly important at the at the same time. So I think there's that's the the value of working with the bright, right brand creators um, is that they can hold those two things at the same time. And, you know, and still find a way to um, create uh, an identity that, um, you know, fulfills those needs. Yeah, I think we live in a world of transparency. And if you try to hide something uh, or you try to be private, <laughs> it's like you're trying to hide, maybe perceived as you're trying that you're trying to hide something, which is not never good. And so and also I would point out that there is no difference between your brand and your brand narrative is what creates your brand. And so there's really no uh, uh, difference there. And so that you you need to create a cohesive, streamlined brand, brand narrative that is able to tell, here's where we're from, here's what we're all about, um, here's here's our point of difference in the world and what we're trying to do in the world, right? Uh, here's um, how you know it's us and not someone else, uh, whether we can point to the foundation or all the things that we've built, made, done already or whatever. Um, and then here are the rituals. This is how we act out in the world. Here's um, how people describe us, the words that we use to describe ourselves. Here's what we're not and don't want to become. And then here's our leadership and who's leading the way that all those pieces that you're able to tell through distributed through all of the social, digital, and traditional media that are out there today. Um, those are what um, the that provide the information necessary for your brand advocates, um, for them to defend you or talk about you. What, who, who are these guys? I've never heard of them before. Oh, they're X, Y, Z, right? Fill in the blanks. And so as long as you provide that information to your advocates, brand zealots, um, they will defend you when times are tough or when someone, uh, when something goes awry out there in the universe. So, yeah, so anyway. So I, I think also something um, you pointed out, Nicholas, which I thought was really interesting was this, you know, with going slightly more public in terms of your brand profile, it ensures that you kind of are proactively owning the narrative uh, around your family office. You're able to craft that. You're able to communicate it in a way um, that allows you to participate in how that is perceived publicly, um, which I think is really sort of key for a lot of family offices, particularly in this day and age where obviously, you know, reputational risk is key. Um, uh, it's consideration for investment strategies, due diligence, and obviously sort of public profiles if they are public uh, facing individual as well. Um, I think, you know, 
let's begin thinking very sort of pragmatically. Okay, so we've we've looked at you know what the benefits of this might be, but perhaps Patrick, I'm going to pick your brain again here. So if I'm thinking you know from a, a family office perspective, I'm deciding okay you know we're we're this opaque organization currently. We'd like to proactively begin to craft a narrative. Um, how do we go about um, launching a brand? What does that process look like? How do I start today? What can I expect during that process? Sure. So what we do, I mean, there are many, many different ways and everyone on the panel here probably has a different way of going about it. But what we do, and we're doing this this week uh, with someone where we basically break down their brand. Okay, where did they come from? Uh, what do they do or intend to do? And in this case, they have done something before very successfully, but you know, how do they, they realize that times are changing, uh, the world is transforming and how do they uh, stay relevant, basically? How do they stay, stay relevant in this new world? And, and then we figure out, um, you know, their website, <laughs> you know, has to be updated and go along with that. And uh, what are the icons uh, that signal here's who they are and what they're all about. Uh, and then we start talking about language, the language, the, in this case, the text, the copy uh, needs to be updated. All of the content needs to be updated across all the streams. And, um, and then what are they not? importantly. And what are you not? It, I thought was just um, coming out of a world of the burger wars and the cola wars and all this that I grew up with. The I just thought it, that human beings needed to battle against something and overcome all odds. You know, it's part of the hero's journey and all that kind of thing. But actually, by defining what we're not helps you helps define who you are. And strategically, this is something that has become very crucial, I would say, in some conversations, because if people are stuck or if they have pivoted too many times or there's a ch change in leadership or there's a change in the world out there that we need to respond to, then defining us by defining what we're not and don't want to become um, helps. I mean, it's just conversational. Well, what if we were like these guys? Oh, we would never do that. <laughs> or what about this over here? Okay, what about this over here then? Oh, we don't want that either. Well, how about this? And you back them into a corner kind of, but but it but at least they're comfortable in that corner and then you work out from there. And and so that's very crucial, I think. And and then the leader. And it may be the existing leader, it might be someone new, or it might be a new generation of leadership. Uh, depends, of course. And so, or might even just be a new product in some cases inside of a company, right? A new product for a new generation. And so the and then we wrap all that together and then figure out how, what goes where. And our construct is very useful for that. Where do we communicate these things? And where does the creation story go? You know, for example, does it go on the website? Does it go on the back of, an, of a package? Uh, does it go, uh, do we make a movie out of it? Uh, if you remember, um, Facebook made that mo movie, uh, The Social Network. Beats by Dre had a movie called The um, Defiant Ones. Um, McDonald's had a movie, probably looked like it was produced by Burger King with, uh, I think Michael Keaton was in it, right? <laughs> I, I always remember the line where they're making the milkshakes. Does it have any milk in it? No. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then um, in and on from there. So uh, if you, you can be as low or as high as you want in terms of media, right? It depends on your budgeting and and what you're comfortable with. But in the US, you have to be in five different places. So what are they? So yep. that includes PR, includes outdoor, includes brochures. Yeah. Some of those places, I mean, again, if you're going after this more private and reserve, you know, you're not, you're, you're not going to be in media and you're not going to be doing the billboards, right? So I think, but I well, think- Well, you are going to be in media in terms of PR, uh, newspaper articles, um, magazine articles, even their, even yeah, if no, I agree. I think, I think in your just, alma mater. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just still trying to build even a, a, a new framework for branding a company and a venture mm -hmm. and then branding the family office because it's just it's just a completely different kind of work and sensitivity. And I think one thing that you said that was speaking to me too of just this, these multi-generational families. For me, single family office, you know, principal led, um, fresh and new, we're, we're learning by the day about this very, you know, vast and, and impactful space. 
Um, but I think the value of the brand for, you know, connecting these multiple generations where you may have, a, you know, a, an existing generation leading and running today, but a, a newer generations coming into uh, needing ultimately to come into senses of leadership or guiding the family mm -hmm. forward. I mean, I think the the brand process, the the you know building a successful brand. That's I think what a lot of conversations that I've had um, with other family offices. Just you know, how do we connect with the next generation? How do we you know kind of bring our values into the forefront? And I think that's really where these through these conversations and ultimately like you know connecting the current generation to the next generation. Um, you know, the brands have a you know the brand has a lot of um opportunity what do they mean now that they didn't mean before yeah, yeah. and i think yeah. that's and, all, and though i agree with you that, right i mean i'm talking about broad broad scope and you're not may not be doing a hollywood movie but i haven't met an organization yet that hasn't wanted to do the video right for the fundraising event etc cetera, etc cetera. so the, it's all the same yeah I, th I think this idea of storytelling in, in its many forms is obviously key um, I guess if there's, you know, just sort of reflecting back. So, so Dennis, thinking about your process, you know, perhaps, may, maybe not, uh, there might have been a little bit of nervousness initially when you were kicking off um, and thinking about, you know, starting the process. Would you mind maybe walking us through a little bit of what your experience was as a sort of family office member um, starting out? How did you select a provider? Um, how did you sort of go through the process? What did you experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I had the benefit of um, of having done a branding work within a number of our portfolio companies on the venture side, uh, particularly those that are more consumer facing, uh, where you know brand is key. Uh, and uh, over the years, so so it's kind of not not one or two um, examples. And, and and I quickly re and I realized by then that listen, the, the, this individual, this firm that is that is doing the work is absolutely critical. You, you know. It's um, it's not just the kind of the, the content or the uh, you know the, the copyright or whatever that you're putting out there, but also the uh, the kind of the, the mentorship process you have to go through to figure out what is it actually that you stand for. And in many respects, for family offices, it's more difficult than for uh, singular brands. You know, if you're an existing company with history and customers and and a, and a particular product, um, that, it, that already shapes a lot of the you know things that you're going to be communicating. And, and you can build a brand around it. Uh, obviously, you can pivot in whichever way, but uh, at least it's a good foundation. And as a family office, actually, you have no foundation uh, unless you have, uh, unless you are really dependent on a large operating business uh, or have a legacy business that you are very well known for. But these are uh, these are a minority of cases, I would say. Um, and and so that is that is a, that is that is a nervousness because you don't have a base to start off with. You really have to. To spend a lot of time uh, debating and uh, answering very personal questions about your values, mm. about um, what is it actually what you're doing, you know, with your life, <laughs> uh, and so it's 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 very much a mentorship process uh, that, that takes a few weeks. Uh, at least in my experience, it took a few weeks, to, not just with myself but also with with my colleagues, um, and we did it both for Concentric and for Airmark at different times, but uh, the process is very similar. Uh, and um, and that actually is a key value driver. You know, the visuals and everything else that comes after is a derivative. And uh, I, I would say maybe I'm sort of down down downplaying the value of that. But uh, there are a lot of talented designers out there, a lot of talented copywriters out there. But there's very few talented people who combine all of this in, in one firm or one organization. Uh, and that's, that's why they're so valuable. Speed. Yeah, that's why they're so valuable. So, 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 so when our founders now go for, let's say, a rebrand project, which you ultimately have to do, even as a family office, every few years you have to kind of look back and see, you know, things have changed, the world has changed. Uh, you, you need to kind of refresh it. Uh, and it can be a very kind of uh, intense process again. Uh, I always recommend our founders that, that go for, um, you know, very professional and uh, the the, be, the 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 sort of the more professional the better the the, the firms you use you use uh, you, my 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 boss I used to work in banking so I had I had a very colorful boss um, he used to say you, you pay peanuts you get monkeys and I think it's very true for for the branding work you know because it's such a such a personal project yeah definitely 
Maybe, Nick, I'd love to pick your brain a little bit on how within family offices and how you begin to think about that sensitivity you spoke about. So how do you begin to kind of um, run a series of different experiments to find out which are the right channels to kind of communicate your brand, how, when, where, what type of sort of traction are you looking for? Uh, what type of metrics are you maybe looking at if you're looking at these things? Uh, you know, looking at this from a venture perspective versus kind of a, sort of a private exclusive perspective. Yeah, I don't think we we've, we've put those kind of that DNA into the the family office brand for us. I mean, it's really again, um, a, a more we're doing this work very different than our venture work. Um, we approach it very differently. For me, I think it's been more almost like a self actualization journey. Um, creating of the Pardone brand, you know, and um, something that we're still feel like we're very in process for. I mean, we've we've brought forward, you know, visual identities, as I've said, we have, you know, language to describe the brand. We've, you know, we've worked on you know, origin stories and where do we come from and why do we come from those places and what do we believe? Um, but yeah, I think it's it's a whole different ball game, if you will, um, building in this space. Um, and I think that's really where we've looked more to, um, you know, inspiration from more legacy heritage based organizations that have rich archives and deep, deep roots in um, working inside the public, doing profound things for society, whether you go back all the way to the Medici's or even to some of the brands that take up a lot of space. Um, in you know maybe the luxury space today, and we're just what are these intrinsic things that make this identity so desirable, so special? So, and I think we actually truly approach that from a very artistic place. Like our team is made up of what I would believe is the majority artist energy, um, and then we couple that with ent entrepreneurial energy in kind of that pur purest form, right? Like going into, you know, uncharted territories, the artists do that very well. And then the entrepreneurs bring order to maybe what has been uncovered. So we use that, I think, DNA in our own brand creation at Pardon. Um, and, you know, and I think that question that came up from Alessandro about like, how do we select the right partner? Um, you know, we, 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 built that kind of inside of our own family office to do that work, A, because we had that ability and we, many of us had, that was our skill, um, was designing brands, building ventures. And now we're starting to, you know, we have tried to, you know, we, we are out in the world meeting, you know, the first time I met Dennis, I said, who did your website? Who, who had the ability to translate you into this? And, you know, I jumped on a call with him right away just to, to find the talent that knows how to work in this kind of um, in this kind of space, it's just a very unique thing, and that's where you know even just having this conversation is illuminating for me um, and you know learning as well. But um, yeah, I think it is very sensitive. It's very different. The goals, the objectives, the you know so again, each family office is going to be different. Some do want people to call them. Others want no one to have their phone number. Um, so I think the yeah. you know those two different approaches, but. Um, but yeah, I think we, we, again, just approaching it from a more artistic lens um, form, you know, more of this intrinsic essence, um, you know, thinking of the world, you know, the work that connects multiple generations. And, um, you know, I think the way we see it is like heritage has this um, individuality to it. We all have a heritage. And how do we, you know, through the, the branding work, like transcend this heritage into more of a a legacy mark, something that kind of stands the test of time. And yeah, I don't think there is a lot of, I don't think that language or that kind of work happens in the venture world. You know, um, your typical startup or your typical company isn't really thinking about legacy. They're not getting to think about some of the luxury touchstones that I think the private wealth space has the capital to invest in. So that's where you know, when you have the resources to invest in brand, um, what the potential to create is, is incredibly profound. And then I think then all of the activities, whether they're investments, philanthropy, um, patronage, all follow that, um, that brand lead. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm going to move on to the 
final section, and I think uh, you know, obviously, much of what uh, Nicholas has said uh, sort of weaves beautifully into that. Um, so, Patrick, I, I might sort of pick your brain on this. I'd, I'd love to kind of get a bit more of a philosophical view, um, sort of following some of that thread uh, that Nicholas um, has mentioned. You know, if you think of a brand within family offices, uh, it very much needs to be a patient brand, right? It's a brand which hopefully is evergreen. Uh, it grows, it evolves. Um, how do you know when it's done, when it's ready to kind of put out into the world? Um, is it well, it's never, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's never really done, is it? I mean, it, it's something that you hope will be long lasting and will, as Nick pointed out earlier, uh, it will survive you, I'll survive you, right? It will be uh, long lasting. And so we, to, this will hit, go back to Alessandro's question, which is a great question and very difficult to, to uh, kind of do on one's own. But the, I would suggest that in, in putting together, to put help put together the pieces, look at the things that are out there. And I think Nick pointed that to this as well. Uh, look at the things out there that you like, you know, like who did your website? And, and who does other people's websites or what, who did a really great logo or did some piece of work? It, I was a global creative director, so it's a little bit easier for me to perceive what is good, what is not, where to find these people and so forth. However, when I'm going out you know, looking for websites uh, or doing some other things, it's not always, not always simple uh, to find that, that one person. And so the, I can understand the frustration or it's harder for me to find an accountant, let me put it that way, or an attorney. Because everyone promises the same thing. How do you pull out who, who the perfect person is for your project, right? And so I can understand that frustration. So one thing that a lot of designers ultimately ask anyway is what are the things that you like out there that you see, whether it's other foundations or just other things out in the world. Uh, Simple's logo. <laughs> I would immediately ask them uh, who did their logo, right? And so the um, because... The importance of that is that you want something that stands for something and looks solid. And one of the things that we do when we're designing logos, uh, when we do that, is to put them with all the other, the bucket of other logos that we like, whether it's, um, I was going to say Twitter, but the original Twitter, Tweety Bird, um, or uh, Facebook, or um, you know, all the rest of them, Airbnb, and so forth. Put them up there. Do, do we fit within that group of people, or are we in the C or D category? Um, and you always want that logo to be, for example, to be great and fit in the A category, because that's in the beginning. That's all you have. So, um, but finding those people is, you know, I would call someone on this crew in this thing. Great. And Dennis, I think, I guess, thinking a little bit about sort of the importance of how, you know, obviously, as the, your brands evolve, and your family office evolve, how do you think the brand will play an integral role in attracting the right type of talent, the right type of, you know, investment opportunities, etc.? I think I think it's key to be honest. I mean, unless you're a very famous name, uh, and you don't need really a brand because the brand is your name. Um, Again, this is a tiny minority. You need, you need a brand or some sort of. Um, I think, particularly the younger generation, they 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 live in brands and they deviate towards them. Uh, they want to work somewhere which has a story, uh, some sort of heritage or some sort of uh, route where it's going. Um, so I think it's critical. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's probably for us, for, for us, for me personally, it's more more critical on the concentric side, which is a, a much more kind of active investment firm and you know it attracts talent it recruits people and uh, and i guess recruits founders by investing in them so that you know that that is absolutely critical uh, and we spend a lot of effort on um, events content uh, you know everything that's involved around maintaining pre brand presence on the family office side it's uh, you know we, we don't recruit tons of stuff right all, all the time so it's a bit it's a bit less i guess accentuated but um but still, uh, prospective partners look at it and they, they take something out of it, you know, for, for sure. So I think for attracting investment opportunities, it's not the key thing, but it's certainly a benefit, I would say, uh, to having to having a story. Google had a sign on their wall, on their office walls, and it said, smart people work with other smart people. And this was their way of attracting other smart people. 
Uh, just ask your friends. If your friend's looking for a job, send them here, right? And I think it's yeah. kind of the same thing uh, because yeah. I never wanted to work on anything that I could, that I had to describe to my mother what it was, you know? And uh, so anyway, I always worked with name brands. And I think that the, the, in the sense of um, people being attacked or from the outside and so forth, if you give them the information that it's all about the brand. It's that it's that story. And so if someone comes out with uh, some other counter story, as people do these days, thank you, Twitter, um, the your advocates will if you give the, if you provide them with the right information going in, will counter that on their own. You don't have to you will not have to defend yourself. You may ultimately. But I, I think on that question, um... Yeah, so we've obviously had an interesting couple of questions sort of coming in around when people begin to kind of engage with your brand. So we, we had a question talking a little bit about sort of how you begin to think about um, when people begin to engage with your brand and create sort of a counter narrative. Um, how, how do you sort of uh, engage with that? Um, and how do you think about it? So uh, Nicholas, maybe over to you. I mean, I haven't had any personal experience in that, um, you know, kind of as it relates to, you know, any negative kind of context of the brand, um, fortunately. But I think, yeah, it, it's still about just the the brand and even in a digital way is just holding, holding the story firm, who you are, what you stand for. Um, and I think it just it, it acts as a, a coming back place where people can just, again, re ground in what we're doing. I think it's it's. Um, whether that's public, whether that's private, if that's a uh, internal document, rituals that the organization has, it doesn't. It it even in the chaos that we're seeing in the world, um, it allows us just to come back to the work that we're intending to do, um, and the value that we believe we bring into, you know, society and and how and why our work matters. And I think that is ultimately what you know a digital or a external brand experience should convey. And I think it's, it's just, a, it became, it almost becomes the, the foundation again of, of whether as the world gets rockier, we stay steady in who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it, why it matters. And ultimately all of the, you know, the rituals, beliefs, systems that um, may be put into those brands. So uh, for those who are experiencing that or have, you know, or who are scared of experiencing something like that by being public, I would actually reverse it. It would be like, it's more scary by not having that foundation and that clarity on who you are, what you're doing, what those values are. Um, and again, people get to choose how public they make those components of their culture. Um, but yeah, I think that's really like where Pardon site and our experience at Pardon.com does not have a lot of CTAs. There's not a lot of call to action. We're not trying, we're not assessing the Google Analytics to see how many leads did we get today. We, if we do look at any of that data, it's like how many people were curious about us? How many people arrived here to read our story, understand the work that we're doing? And, um, and I think a lot of family offices you know, the work is not their own. It's the work that they're empowering, the 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 businesses that they've funded. Um, that's why I think Dennis site is also a beautiful and very poetic example of just, you know, the artist kind of essence behind him and a portfolio of both artistic, um, very artistic forward ventures and also those that, you know, have a, um, you know, a capitalistic model of them, whether they're, you know, they're selling art or selling contemporary dance, but it looks more like an artist's portfolio um, than your typical venture portfolio. So I think it's, again, it's um, very clear um, the impact that, and I think that's really where um, by having all of that established, again, it just becomes that, that footing for the organization and, and, you know, how you show what you're, investing in what you're empowering what you're actually what you're using your wealth to um create in the world we so, have a process where we ask the questions beforehand and then we answer those questions so that if someone attacks you know what our values or or what we're what we're, our purpose or what we're all about or our authenticity uh we have an answer so that we can be pro our clients can be proactive and rather than being reactive and have those 2 30 in the morning <laughs> conversations so 
I would just probably probably add to Nicholas and build on what you're saying. You know, if you already have a brand, even if you don't want it, you know, it's already out there. It's just created by somebody else and then the narrative is being populated by somebody else. And the more famous you are, the more prolific you are as a business person or as a philanthropist or artist, uh, the more there'll be people who would want to contribute to your brand without you even sort of having any control of it. So yeah. I think in that sense, it's probably, I agree with Nikos 100%. It's more scary to be private actually than public uh, and control your own sort of narrative and destiny, um, be it related to privacy concerns that a lot of uh, people have been asking in, in, in the comments here, uh, but also in terms of the attacks uh, point that uh, was raised earlier. Fantastic. Well, it's been a fascinating conversation today. Um, thank you, all of you, for tuning in. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Obviously, some of the topics we've unpacked today, the importance of sort of going through the process of having foundational values tied to the narrative that you're wanting to sort of uh, create and, and put forward in the world, and then also understanding that those values uh, you know, can reinforce your sort of family uh, perpetually uh, throughout time. Um, Jess, over to you. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Patrick, Dennis, Nicholas, for sharing your wisdom so generously with us. Um, building a family office brand is clearly a hot topic, one we're only just getting started with. If you're familiar with Simple, you'll know that this webinar forms part of an ongoing series where we find new ways to shed light and increase transparency into the family office industry. Our next discussion will tackle strategic ser service provider selection so make sure you don't miss that one. If you'd like to learn more about the work we do at Simple, including our high touch service offering and new products for family offices, please reach out to the Simple team. We can act as strategic dis discussion partners. We can help you solve specific problems such as finding the right providers, or we can assist with expansion by connecting you with our network across the globe. Drop us a mail or a note in the comment section. We would love to hear from you. And lastly, Thank you to everyone who tuned in today. The Simple Network only continues to grow, and we're so proud to have such an engaging and receptive audience. For anyone who would like to revisit this discussion, the recording will be available to watch right here on our LinkedIn page or via the pl Simple platform. So once more, thank you to everyone who made today possible, and we hope to see you at the next one. Bye for now.